get started in here. Let's take a look at the site survey requirements, and those are found in the Canadian Aviation Regulations, which you can find just by Googling that. And then you want to click on the site that has not the TC website, but the Justice website. So we'll click here. This is where they're actually hosted. All the Canadian laws are on here. And this will take us right to the very beginning in part one. And that's not where we want to be. We want to be in part nine. So let's click table of contents and then scroll forever down to the bottom. And all the drone regulations show up in part nine. Told you it was at the bottom. Okay, and this is where they start. Part nine, remotely piloted aircraft systems. And we are looking for division three, which is general operating and flight rules. And car 901.27 is the one that specifically has to do with site surveys. So we click that, it brings us to the regulation, which says no pilot shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system unless before commencing operations, they determine that the site for takeoff, launch, landing, or recovery is suitable for the proposed operation by conducting a site survey. And that site survey has to include all of these things A through H. And this applies to both basic and advanced operations. So item A is the boundaries of the area of operation. B is the type of airspace and applicable regulatory requirements. We'll look at how to find this shortly. The altitudes and routes to be used on the approach to and departure from the area of operation. The proximity of manned aircraft operations. The proximity of aerodromes, airports, and heliports. And these two things are not necessarily the same thing. They can be related because there tends to be manned aircraft operations in proximity of aerodromes, airports, and heliports, but they don't have to be. So you could be operating within a flight training area. Uh, so that's not necessarily to do with aerodromes, airports, and heliports, but it does mean that there will be lots of aircraft and potentially below uh, the altitudes that uh, you will be flying at. You could also have um, manned aircraft operations in terms of heli logging or float planes landing on a lake. You could have um, air routes that are flying overhead and bringing lots of air traffic that you're seeing while you're on site. So those are important things to note and we'll take a look at how to find those next. Um, then we have the location and height of obstacles, including wires, mass buildings, cell phone towers, and wind turbines. And I also like to add things that are still obstacles, but not necessarily super tall things. So it could be like a fence line. It's got barbed wire at the top. You don't want to fly your drone past that fence because if it decides it's going to land on the far side, you wouldn't have a way of getting to it. Um, could also be something like a, a lake or a big body of water that you don't want to operate your drone over. That's still an obstacle and would be worth uh, noting on your site survey. Uh, item G is predominant weather and environmental conditions for the area of operation. So you could look that up in advance in the office, but then you'd also want to have a spot where you can note the conditions once you arrive on site. And then horizontal distances from persons not involved in the operation. And that the regulatory requirements around that are going to have a difference depending on whether you're a basic category pilot or advanced category pilot and what type of aircraft or what uh, safety assurance declaration your aircraft has. So with basic category pilots, the horizontal distance has to be at least 30 meters or 100 feet. And then if you're advanced category, it will depend on that safety assurance declaration. So it could be over people. It could be you can fly up to five meters or 16 feet from people. Or it could be that your aircraft has just been safety assured for flights in controlled airspace and you're required to stay that 100 feet, 30 meters away from people, just like basic category operations. Let's take a look at how we might lay out this information on a more easy to use on the day of form, a few different options and where you can find the information to complete your site survey. Before we get into the contents of a site survey in detail, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's one from a recent flight review candidate. You can see that they have the location of the flight review relative to the aerodromes that surround aerodromes and airports, as well as contact information for those aerodromes and airports. Some maximum safe distances listed as well. And this was the second page that included the airspace, 
some information about the flight, any coordination that was required, and a more detailed map of the flight area. And importantly, it also has a spot for notes at the bottom, and that allows the candidate to add more information once they get on site if they're unfamiliar with the location that they'll be flying at. Here's another version that was submitted by a flight review candidate. So you can see where the flight boundaries are going to be, the points. This looks like it was done on Google Earth. And then as well has a little bit of an inset with the flight review location relative to the airspace. And then there's another version here, and this one is more of a form, so it would be completed uh, when you're on site and allows you to indicate if the ground crew has been briefed and accepted, and then as well has some areas to be sure that um, you're taking off the required items prior to flight. So it's a little bit of a checklist as well as completing all the required site survey information. Let's take a look at assessing each one of these site survey requirements. So the first one is the boundaries of the area of operation. For this, you can use a few different tools, but I wanted to show you a way that you can do this for free. I use Google Earth, and I've zoomed in onto the site where I am right now. Our building is very new, and on Google Earth, it's still under construction. But we're gonna pretend to fly out in behind the building here, right at this location. So because the building's here, you can use this to denote the area of the operation. I'm gonna draw a polygon. We'll call it flight boundary. And we'll make it red. There we go. So we've determined the boundaries of the area of the operation. On some sites that'll be easier than others because you'll know what's expected. You could also just cover the entire site and then further narrow it down once you get on site. Now we need to look at the type of airspace and applicable regulatory requirements. And for that we'll use the drone site selection tool that's done by the National Research Council of Canada in association with Transport Canada. If it's your first time using this tool, you'll want to read through this overview um, because I've used it a few times. I'll just go in here and click Advanced. And because I'm actually on site of where I want to fly right now, then I can just set my map center for where I am. You can also enter in a latitude and longitude on here. Let's minimize that. So it drops the pin and I just confirmed that it went to the right spot and that is correct. That's where we are. You can look at it on here too. This is just Google Maps. So we are at the right spot here. And if we zoom out a little bit, we can see these airspace and aerodrome circle bubbles that are drawn. So because I selected advanced, it's not showing anything as being red and restricted because I am permitted to fly there as long as I get appropriate permission. But by hovering over the circles, you can see what is existing at those locations. So over here we have Langley's control zone. It's class C or space from the surface up to 1,900 feet. Um, Pitt Meadows is kind of unique in that there's two aerodromes that are co-located because there is the runway surfaces, which you can kind of see by these the cross shape here. There's two parallel runways and then a north-south one as well. Uh, but there's also a water drone. So that's this other circle that you're seeing. That yellow is three nautical miles surrounding the water aerodrome. And then the three nautical mile control zone matches up with the yellow for the, uh, the hard surface runways as well. Same thing in Langley. The control zone is three nautical miles, so it matches up. Um, Fort Langley circle here, um, that's the three nautical miles from the center of that, uh, or I guess it's from the water drone that it's showing. But there also is a runway there um, that's prior permission required. It's not used a ton, but um, it, you get these hot dog shapes around the runways so that um, you know to steer clear. Those are areas where there's going to be higher 
aircraft operations. Even though you're allowed to operate there, you should still be aware that there could be aircraft there. And if you click on the bubble, it gives you some airspace access procedures. There's a form on the Nav Canada website that you fill out, some details about it. So all in all good information. And because there's no bubble over top of us, we know that we're not in controlled airspace. We're not in uh, anything where we need to get permission first. We're in class G. So if we click back over the type of airspace and applicable regulatory requirements, we're in class G and there are no Nav Canada authorities or DND authorities that we need to get permission from. Altitudes and routes to be used on the approach and departure from the area of operation. That we can go back to our Google Earth. And on here, um, because I'm flying a multi-rotor and I don't need a huge area for approach and departure, I can just drop a pin and say, take off and landing. And just to be fun, I can change it to something more interesting, like an airplane. Maybe we'll do the helicopter. So I'll say that I'm going to take off and land from here. And altitudes and routes, I'm just going to say, will be within the bubble that's established for the, the flight boundary. So I'm going to stay within there. The proximity of manned aircraft operations is next. So let's take a look at the, the chart for this area. So I'm on flightplan.com, go to digital charts and then sectionals. That's the US term for the VNC. And then in the map layers here, we want to make sure the TAC charts are selected. And then we'll go to sectionals Canada. So we get that overlaid. And here you can see how the TAC chart, or it's called a VTA in Canada, gets overlaid when that's selected, and we want that to happen so it's a little bit easier to read the information. And here we are. So it doesn't show our crossroads exactly, but based on the other chart, we know we're kind of in this area, just off 200th Street, which is what this is showing. And we know we're outside of the Langley Control Zone, so this is a good spot. So if we kind of keep that in mind, I'm going to hide this. We can take a look for symbols that will indicate that there are manned aircraft operations in the vicinity. So some things you could look for are these triangle routes, because that's showing you that that's where aircraft are being suggested to travel through. And you'll notice that they're going from these hexagons with the flags. They're called VFR call-up points. So anytime that you see those on maps, it's likely that that's where you will see manned aircraft because they fly to these known points to fly in or out of airports. So it's a good idea to look out for those. Um, I know from local knowledge that because we have Class C control zone that you need permission to operate in here, as well as here, there tends to be a tendency for people to use this gap as a bit of a corridor to get back and forth out here because this area is indicated by the class F here and then up here as well are popular flight training areas. So there's a lot of manned aircraft traffic that flies back and forth. Other things that can show that there's other aircraft around, we've got gliders, ultralights, water drones, more water drones. The fact that the river's here, there's a lot of float traffic. So there tends to be quite a bit of air traffic that's overhead of us here, even though we're not within controlled airspace. So that addresses that one, the proximity of manned aircraft operations, and then the proximity of aerodromes, airports, and heliports. We can go back to the drone site selection tool, and we know that we're at least three nautical miles away, just over three nautical miles away from Langley and Pitt Meadows. But if you wanted to do some measuring, there is a way to do that on here, if I remember how. Ah, here we go. Show measurement tool. And to do it, you just double click and then you can drag your points to where you want to go. 7,733 meters. Let's 
four nautical miles. Works for me. That tool is also available in uh, Google Earth as well if you needed to measure between two points. So I would do this to all the aerodromes that are within close proximity so that I know how far away they are from me. And I would list those on my site survey. So that was proximity of manned aircraft operations, proximity of aerodromes, airports and heliports, location and height of obstacles, including mass buildings, cell phone towers, wind turbines, etc. So you can get some of that information from looking at the map, but as you might sometimes encounter, it doesn't look like there's a building here because when this was last updated, they hadn't even broke ground. So if we go over to Google Earth, we can see that the building does exist, um, but still it's not a very accurate representation of what currently exists around here. There isn't a giant crane over the property anymore. So we could put that there's a large building on the east side. Um, looks like there's some open area to the rest of it, but when we arrive on site, we want to leave space to update that regardless of whether it looks like it's a brand new building or not. And then the next requirement the predominant weather and environmental conditions for the area of operation. So we can just go weather forecast Langley. And we could jot down some of this information. Looks like it's going to be pretty much the same all week long, which is kind of nice. Uh, and then, of course, you'd want to do a reassessment once you arrive on site as well. And then horizontal distances from people not involved in the operation. Um, because we're flying on private property uh, with the site here, uh, we just have to make sure that the common areas where people could approach from, like kind of the sidewalk area, we'd want to make sure that that is restricted. We have someone kind of watching it, but with the drones that we fly, we can be up to five meters away from people. So it makes it pretty straightforward to fly in this general area with all this open space around. And that is it. Those are the site survey requirements. So you can do the majority of the site survey from your desk, and then it's a matter of cross-checking the information with what's available when you arrive on site to make sure that everything that you, all the work that you did when you were in the office makes sense when you arrive on site. Mm -hmm.